Well, good morning and thank you for coming uh, along. This is uh, just one of our resuming some of our regular briefings, so there's, there's nothing particularly exciting to say but to cover off one or two things that I think uh, are necessary. So rebuilding and trading again in the CBD are largely dependent uh, on uh, getting some of the um, demolitions that are still required um, into a state that makes uh, those areas in the city safe. The end of last year, there was a concerted push by Sarah to get demolitions uh, of the major high-rise buildings underway. Today, almost all significant structures in the CBD that will be demolished are contracted and work has begun on most of those buildings. The Clarendon Towers, BNZ Tower, uh, Art Gallery Apartments, the Crown Plaza, you will all be able to see uh, are progressing very, very well. NZI House is underway, as is Westpac Tower, and the neighbouring Holiday Inn is also coming down, uh, although that demolition will be owner-managed. Uh, in the next few weeks, Sarah will finalise contracts for the Price Waterhouse Coopers building, uh, which looks uh, out onto the river. Uh, outside the CBD, the Ferrymead Apartments uh, Park on the terrace and Dorset Towers are some of the taller buildings that have demolition work currently underway. As the more significant demolitions progress, it will make it easier to reduce the cordon. Uh, we had said that we'd like to get that cordon completely uh, down to uh, perhaps just being around uh, some buildings by April. I think as uh, more assessment has been made and uh, more buildings have uh, question marks hanging over them, uh, that is looking uh, less and less possible. But every effort is being made to reduce that cordon uh, as, as uh, quickly as possible. Uh, starting with the, the eastern side coming back into the city. The Home Clearance and Trials project that was started in Bexley uh, progressed very, very well and Sarah has learned a great deal about how to do this work. The trial confirmed the theory that working with a bundle of properties at one time works well, it's cost effective and it means that a single contractor can develop a programme and operate uh, within a community uh, with as least little disruption as possible. There's been a great feedback, I have to say, from residents about the contractor who undertook that trial, and it's very heartening to hear that, uh, encouraging for the big job that lies ahead of us. Uh, on average, 70% of the materials in those houses has been recycled, uh, which is a very, very high level given the nature of these demolitions and damage to the property. However, one of the key uh, issues that uh, you're aware of already that came up during that trial was the issue of security of those properties. And we are working very closely with the police on this. We've already noticed that making widespread announcements about exactly which houses are being demolished and exactly when they're likely to be demolished uh, does tend to make them a target for uh, criminal elements. And so we want to avoid uh, that sort of uh, situation because a lot of these houses are in close proximity to other residential areas. Uh, what Sarah does and can, will continue to do is hold meetings with the community that still live in the area. Uh, community wellbeing staff will go door to door letting people know uh, exactly what's coming up in their neighbourhood. Residents will be given written information on the process and after the work is done Sarah staff go back uh, to get feedback on how well the project was uh, carried out. I think it's important to remember that what we are doing here has never been done anywhere else in the world in this way. So we are in fact uh, right here in Christchurch writing the book on how these things should be done post uh, these types of disasters. So the next batch of demolitions will begin later this month uh, in parts of Bexley and Kaiapoi. Uh, Sarah's undertaken as I said to follow that process to speak to all the neighbours to let them know what's going on uh, before there is any wider spread notification in a public sense so that we do preserve the options for people's uh, individual security. The Port Hills White Zone continues to be a uh, big focus of our work here, but we're not in this on our own. The Christchurch City Council has very important roles to play and we are somewhat reliant on the speed with which they are able to work. Sarah has hosted, however, community meetings with 1,600 residents in the Port Hills uh, this week to explain some of the details of the process and the timeline for work in the area. An information book that's also been produced for Port Hills residents. And one of the things uh, discussed in some detail was the 3D modelling study. As we explained last time, uh, we had a briefing here 
Its purpose is to supplement the data being collected by Christchurch City Council and also complementary the complement uh, the Christchurch City Council's work. The key purpose is to identify rockfall corridors where rocks are likely to travel in significant seismic events. The other aim of the work is to work out bounce heights and the magnitude of impact those rocks uh, which will inform, uh, it's, it is the magnitude of the impact of those rocks that will inform the engineering solutions needed to mitigate rockfall in many parts of the Port Hills. This study is being carried out by uh, Grover and Freefall in conjunction with Milan University who are, who are world experts uh, in these matters. The study is expected to be concluded by the end of March. And as we've said before, once these studies are in and fully understood, they will inform rezoning decisions for the Port Hills residents progressively uh, through to June. Roger's going to speak more about uh, uh, that shortly uh, and indicate greater detail on some of that work. There are still 653 uh, properties remaining in the orange zone, and I expect that the rezoning of those uh, will be announced by the end of March. We had, uh, 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 as you know, so far around about um, 7,000 households that have uh, been put into the red zone. Uh, we've had 4,779 homeowners engaged in the settlement process as at uh, the 27th of February. Uh, 2,590 have fully settled and have moved on uh, and the value of those settlements to date has been around about $487 million. Another 109 will settle before Monday, in other words settle today, uh, and we'll keep you regularly updated on how that settlement process is going. Uh, but uh, I think it's important to note that when you've got uh, well over half of the people in those zones already engaged in a settlement process, uh, and around about a third of them settled, uh, things are going along at a very, very good rate and people are finding they can make choice in their life. Uh, economic activity is something that we have focused on all the way through. Um, uh, given that, you know, immediately after the September 4 event and then reconfirmed uh, with greater magnitude after the February 22nd event, there were some suggestions that we could lose large chunks of population and that our economy here would almost completely disintegrate, uh, making the whole place a bit of a, a basket case. Nothing could be further from the truth, and I think it's a great tribute to uh, people here in Canterbury, and I've said it before, who have made efforts in their daily lives to keep business places open, uh, to keep their, their work places providing services, uh, right through from uh, any of the social services to uh, you know, uh, retail shopping, etc. Up and running, uh, and that uh, tribute is is seen in the extraordinary economic figures that are coming out for Canterbury. We've had record freight movements and value of trade through the ports and the airport, and manufacturing has been strong. And there's even more encouraging news when you start to look at some of the economic growth stats uh, for Canterbury compared to the rest of New Zealand. And if I can quote the National Bank Regional Trends Economic Survey for the three months to December. It showed that uh, Canterbury had economic growth of just under 1%, which compares very favourably to the rest of New Zealand. That figure at this stage has not been revised uh, for other uh, matters that might come into it, but I would point out that the March figure of last year, uh, our growth rate was 2.8%. In the September quarter of last year, our growth rate was uh, around about 2.1%. Uh, both of those were figures were revised up from the initial uh, figures that were released. So I'd expect that the final growth rate for Canterbury in the December quarter, uh, despite the disaster of uh, uh, you know, the December 23 affecting those figures, will be well ahead of that 1%. And that compa it compares very, very favourably with what's happening in other parts of the country. Uh, and I, I suggest that you may want to look at that National Bank survey to make those comparisons because it's a, an extremely good story and it is totally a tribute uh, to everybody uh, in the workplace in, in Canterbury. And speaking of the workplace, uh, our unemployment rate has improved. Uh, so we've gone from 5.2% unemployment in September down to 5% uh, in the December quarter. 
uh, and that compares very, very favourably uh, to the national average of 6.3%. Uh, so job advertisements uh, increased by about 5% in the three months of December uh, and is currently running at about 55% higher uh, than the same time in 2010. So, uh, you know, the last week there's been a lot of focus about, uh, you know, some welfare reforms and the question about where are the jobs. A very large number of those jobs are right here in Canterbury and we can expect that to increase in the months ahead. The start of the residential rebuild, I think, is also being reflected uh, in a 15% rise in the number of dwellings uh, approved or consented. Uh, uh, and we haven't seen levels of dwelling consents at current level uh, since about June of 2010. So uh, we, we're starting on a track that is going to see that uh, level of consenting, that level of activity rapidly uh, uh, increase over the, last, uh, uh, over the next few months. So all in all, I think um, every, every indicator that you can look at shows that uh, Canterbury is making progress and that uh, uh, we are just starting to see the, the very thin end of what will be a sharp wedge uh, upward in our rebuilding activity. Uh, nothing will ever go as fast as we want, uh, but you know the, the work that people every day are doing is uh, certainly paying fruit, uh, bearing fruit, and uh, I think is uh, giving a good indication that we've got a solid future in front of us here. Um, I was just going to quickly follow about the, what Minister was saying about the rockfall stuff. So we've got a big um, 3D rockfall study going on at the moment. I, I I couldn't get our projector to go this morning, but there's a sort of stuff that we're that they're modelling. So they produce a really sophisticated computer model, this is University of Milan stuff, of trying to understand where rocks are, what the exact shape of the land is, where houses are, to then work out where rocks are going to go if you get further further shakes or in fact big rain, rainfall events as well. So we'll do some more briefings on this next week because I think we've been out in the Port Hills talking to people about it at these public meetings over this last week. But I think it's actually been giving people a lot of sort of confidence that we're actually doing some really smart um, computational work to try and work out where these rocks would go, so where people are going to be safe or where houses um, aren't going to be safe in the future. I'll ask that, uh, that Roger do a separate briefing on this, that all the graphics that are available that are made available to you, uh, so that you can you know, let people know just uh, you know, how complex this is. It's not a simple matter, we're not trying to muck people around and you, you hear stories from people saying, well, I don't really have a problem. I think some people uh, need to accept that there could be uh, problems in their near vicinity that may affect them very adversely uh, at, at a future time. So we just, we just, there's a degree of caution being exercised in the briefing will let you know um, how that's, why that is, uh, what those considerations are, and also uh, give you a bit of a, an instinct for how long the time is going to take to get to that decision, but progressively up to June. Thank you, Minister. Um, I think it was good to hear the Minister talking about the economic recovery stuff. Um, and it's always great when I've got investors here talking to us about investing in the city to give them you know, a real genuine story of the fact the city is still actually going like, you know, going flat out. And the, all those economic indicators remain so though very positive. At the same time, there's often still a lot of volunteer work going on. Um, last weekend, um, more than 300 volunteers turned out for this Get It Done programme. Some of you will have covered it, a lot of you haven't, but this was organised by this guy, um, Dion Swiggs. And uh, they cleaned up something like, um, I can't remember how many sections, my notes don't have it here, but they worked throughout the eastern suburbs doing getting rid of more of that liquefaction stuff that was left behind from the December the 23rd. We also actually organised one or two, some other sort of guys with bigger earth, earth moving equipment to go into a couple of places where people had come to us about where they still had a lot of liquefaction there. So we don't sort of, well I guess I am about to yell it from, from, from the top of the treetops, but if people call us at our 0800 Sierra line, we will do our best to coordinate with, and they've got those really still significant issues like their house is still full of liquefaction. We'll do our best to connect them with people who can actually help them. So we're not really a welfare agency as such, but we're the organisation that knows where to, send the, where to send people so they can actually get some real help, and I think that's actually going pretty well. But there was a couple in the 80s who came to us last week who still had silt from the 23rd of December and we were able to put them in touch with a bunch of people who've got some really heavy earth moving equipment and we got that stuff moved out. So, you know, while there's all this hard economic stuff going on, there's also a real softer side to this business where we're trying to connect these people who've got real needs 
with other people who want to do the right thing by them as well. Just also on that sort of softer stuff, um, as we all have noticed, um, coming to work this morning on our bikes, it was a bit colder. So summer seems to be over. Um, so we're working with a bunch of organisations to try and make sure we get that sort of winter heating message out there. Um, we put together all, um, a range of city organisations put together a booklet last year about um, staying healthy and safe this winter. Um, I know EQC's program, they got something like 14,000, um, was it 14,000 winter heating devices out there last winter, it was an extraordinary effort. Um, I know EQC are doing more work at the moment to try and make sure they're getting to people that were perhaps missed out last winter or still need help. But there's also the, DB, the DBHB are also working in partnership with Community Energy Action, the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Authority, the PHOs and ECAN to do another rollout in terms of underfloor and ceiling insulation and I think they could target up to 5,000 properties this winter as well. Um, stats, we love our numbers here and um, one of the stats is we've had, um, what is it, two and a half million page views um, on our website since we, since we got underway in March last year with the average person looking at three, just over three pages. So, you know, we're doing an awful lot to try and get messages out there, whether it be on our website, whether it be stuff like this, or whether we're actually fronting up to these, these public meetings that we continue to try and tell people what's really happening out there. And also front up to them and tell them and be willing to answer their real questions. Um, lastly, just going to advertise some events because I think it's important that everybody gets out there and does stuff. Um, where is it? The Godwits? What's that one? Well, first, I mean, the Godwits, there's a, you know, the Godwit birds from South Shore. I think this is really cool. So there's a need to farewell these birds. They leave, they, I've got here, they leave on the 9th of March. I don't think they leave on the 9th of March, but there's an event with a barbecue and so on on the 9th of March. I think it's really important that you guys sort of promote these sort of things that people wouldn't normally go to, which are actually kind of fun and exciting. The Godwits, despite the earthquake, are still coming here, and, and they're still leaving, every, they're all still leaving at you know, the, turning of the, um, the turning of the seasons as well. So there's a, um, a free barbecue, um, bring your binoculars but don't bring your dogs um, and they're going to be flying back to their Alaskan breeding ground. But I think it's really cool that we go out and still do these things we wouldn't normally do. Um, so you go down to Rocking Horse Road, free barbecue, South Shore, South, South Shore Spit Reserve at the end of Rocking Horse Road. So you know, um, the Ellerslie Flower Show of course starts soon, with a few gnomes in there perhaps. They're all very attractive, I understand. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you're laughing at me or smiling at me, Minister. <laughs> and of course, the rugby stadium. The rugby stadium opens up on the 24th of March. So you know, you know, with all the stuff that's going on in there, all that sort of greyness we have, there's some really positive stuff going on out there. And I hope we really fill that stadium up for the first game against the, ch the Cheetahs on the 24th. There's about 400 people working out there, and in fact the Carisbrook lights have been recycled. I hope we paid fair value to the Otago Rugby Union for that. So I think that's just fantastic. 